salty, squidgy sea cucumber, also known as beche de mer or trepang, isn't high on the list of quality seafoods Australia is known for. But it played a pivotal role in pre-colonial Australian international trade. Broom reporter Erin Park joined an expedition to find out more about the Southeast Asian fishing crews who once harvested trepang off the remote north coast of Western Australia. It's a corner of Australia that is not quick nor easy to get to. It takes a charter plane and a drive down rocky bush tracks to get to the coastline of the Queenie people on the northernmost tip of Western Australia. But for this research team, it's worth it. They'll be spending three weeks literally unearthing the little known history of Australia's first international trade, the trepang industry, which saw thousands of fishermen from Southeast Asia set up camp on the northern coast of Australia. This is an important part of history. A lot of this activity is occurring prior to colonisation of this, this particular part of the North West. So it's an Asian industry working with traditional owners. So you should get some pretty interesting outcomes. The project will use radiocarbon dating and the oral histories of local Aboriginal people to piece together this mysterious industry. We was hearing it. Yeah, we was hearing stories then because of us coming in all that. Even though when he was kids, they still was some um, coming around, but in a sneak, you know. The team are up before dawn to head to the island where it's thought the Indonesian fishing crews camped, possibly as early as the 1700s. So uh, what's the plan for today? We're up nice and early. Yep, we're heading off to Nuwalara uh, via Point. This is a site we've visited previously. There's a number of stone arrangements there that are uh, trying lines that I described the other day where we boil down the tree pang. So we've set up uh, a trench around one set of these try lines, which we're going to start excavating today. And how are you feeling about getting started today? Very excited. It's always good to be out here. Like I love starting early. It's the best view in the world, really. <laughs> The site is about 500 kilometres west of Darwin. It's a similar distance from the island archipelagos of what's now Indonesia and East Timor. And that's what made the area so appealing to Asian fishers seeking out an underwater delicacy. So Tripang, also known as Besh de Mer, it's a sea cucumber. It was fished to be taken back to Indonesia and sold on to Chinese markets as an aphrodisiac and a culinary delight. The men who came south to fish are often called Macassans, but they actually came from many different parts of what's now Indonesia. The Dutch East Indies, as it was known from the 17th century onwards, was under Dutch rule. Um, Indonesian people still had to make a living, so where they would traditionally hunt for tree pang in local waters, that supply was now under high demand with colonial trade interests. So they started pushing further south towards Australia and we started seeing fishing camps turning up all along the Northern Territory coast as well as Western Australia. The Southeast Asian fishing crews would arrive in about December each year and then set up camp on remote beaches like this one for about four months at a time. So they would have been here through the very hot, humid Northern Australian wet season. They then set about collecting, boiling and drying as many sea cucumbers as they could to take back home and sell to Chinese merchants. There's a fair bit known about the trepang industry in the Northern Territory, but less about the history of the Kimberley. So the aim is to find out where the fishermen came from, when they arrived, and how they interacted with Indigenous Australians, who'd already been living here for tens of thousands of years. Queenie people first showed these campsites to archaeologists in the 1960s. Now their descendants hold a smoking ceremony to welcome the new generation of researchers. We do this when people travel into our land. Also it's uh, used, smoking is also used 
for like um, sorry business and when we are entering somebody else's land you know we smoke them too it's important to us the island of Niwalara has a complex history so it was proclaimed a national park back in 2019 and it's got a lot of different heritages on it that we know a little bit about and we're still doing some more work to find out. Uh, the island was used as a, a base for both US and Australian soldiers during World War II. So there's some remnant um, sites scattered across the island. There are of course a lot of indigenous sites from um, a legacy of use. There were people living on the island as late as the 1920s. Um, there have been various other ventures on here. There was an attempt to farm cotton on here sometime in the 1930s. That was not the world's most successful attempt. Um, and of course what we're investigating right now, which is the history of interaction um, with Indonesian seafarers coming down to extract resources from the marine environment. The painstaking work begins, carefully removing layers of soil and sand on what the archaeologists believe is a hearth built hundreds of years ago. So we've taken off the top layer of this shelly sediment and we've revealed the five places, of which we think we've got five. We know a, a mothership would come down, a big Indonesian prow, and come down with a fleet. Um, there are some historical references of fleets of 30 boats coming in down off the Western Australian coast. And from those boats, you'd have a series of canoes coming in and doing the fishing and bringing the catch to shore to do that processing. And so what we're looking for in this landscape is actually remains of that, that tree pang processing. So you would have camps as well as an industrial site, if you will. What we see is these lines of stones, which are actually individual halves all put together. And on these halves would have sat these big iron cooking pots, which were used to boil down the tree pang, the catch that they would take off the, the banks and offshore reefs just from here. These sketches from the early 1800s show similar scenes in what's now the Northern Territory. But the intriguing question for the researchers how were the fishermen interacting with local Aboriginal people who had foreigners entering their land for the first time? We get to tap into the incredible knowledge base, the cultural knowledge base that traditional owners have. We have uh, some living memories of um, traditional owners' parents who can... Um, stories passed down through generations. My mother remembers doing this. Um, my grandfather's grandfather, this happened. Uh, some of that oral history coming down through to inform what's going on. It's a plum tree or what? Ngabin, Ngabin, eh, they call it. That big tree next to it, that's the boomerang tree. They make boomerang out of it. Dorothy Jangara is a Warrnambool elder who's agreed to share her knowledge and memories with the researchers. In those days, some of our people used to talk the Indonesian way. They um, learn the way of uh, to talk in their language. While it's impossible to know for sure, she believes it was a friendly relationship based on exchanges of goods, knowledge and even people. The black fellow in here didn't, didn't have any canoes. They used to build their raft on dry driftwoods and paperback. And then when they uh, met the Indonesians, they had to trade for their canoes. Sometimes they had to trade with young girls. They had to take the girls out to the Indonesian, never come back. I think like uh, this. The field work has led to another exchange of information with a new generation of Gwini people. Well, I got a um, bit of tricks and trade, like how to uh, Aboriginal and trade with the Macassum, so <laughs> I've done that with the archaeologists. So <laughs> Ian Wainer grew up just south of here at the Columbaroo community. He's been helping archaeologists in the Kimberley for more than a decade and is glad the research is being done. So it'll be interesting, yeah, we'll get down. Lovely. You're going to land there, land there. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's like... Yeah, but the charcoal like, yeah. is all very similar all yeah. the way through. The main thing they focus on, like, it's, it's like under the earth, it's, it's like a diary to them. It's in the same way, you know, like for rock painting, it's like a diary to us. It's just written all over there. So it's, it's with archaeologists. It's, it's all the words is just 
right under this very earth. No, it won't run out. Just a Back at the dig pit, the team are making progress. Yeah, so we've had a pretty successful day. We're finding pieces of charcoal, which is really great because that's what we want to take home and uh, a carbon-14 date, and that will help us narrow down the age range of the site. The samples and artefacts are carefully packed and transported to Perth to be analysed by a team of scientists led by Professor Alastair Patterson at the University of Western Australia. The main thing that we're really interested in from these sites are the ceramics, um, because we don't have ceramics, obviously, in northern Australia. Um, these are basically all ceramics from Asian uh, potters, probably locally made in villages on different islands. And so um, some of them are decorated, as you can see, and some are much more basic. They would have brought all their food and rice and other things, cooking materials down um, to Australia and left them behind when they got broken. So we take a thin section. You can actually see a thin section has been removed from it. And then we can actually use those thin sections, put them underneath the microscope and basically get a fingerprint of the composition of them and use that to figure out, hopefully, where they came from in Asia. The team have got back the first results from the radiocarbon dating, with the possibility of older dates still to come. Our initial radiocarbon dates, the first ones that we've just got back, suggest that these sites are occupied around 1800, so just over 200 years ago. Um, which is perfect because that's the same time as we see the industry start to expand in Arnhem Land as well. The Dutch historical records would suggest that people start coming down probably in the mid-1700s to the Kimberley Coast and starting to um, extract some resources like Trepang, but then it really picks up around 1800. They'll also be testing artefacts that were found at the sites by the Western Australian Museum in the 1960s. That includes a Dutch coin from 1823 and a musket ball. Professor Patterson, who spent several weeks at the Kimberley sites as part of the project, says the trepang industry represents Australia's first international trade. This is really modern. Uh, this, this is an industry that really resembles, I guess, Australia today. I like to think of these as kind of sail in, sail out, CISO workers coming from Asia to basically be there for their season and then head home again. Um, and it's really about meeting global markets. So really the story of kind of much of early Australia it really isn't sheep, it's actually marine resources. So it's probably time that we thought about that. Back on the Kimberley coast, the fieldwork is close to wrapping up. There's excitement about the results to come that will give a glimpse of the interactions that occurred here decades before white settlers arrived. I think this is a, an unknown part of Australian history. And what I like about it, it actually starts to showcase other people coming to visit and the sort of interactions they have with people on country we just don't know about yet. For the Queenie people, confirmation of a complex past that they've always known. And you get to understand both ways, like two ways of seeing history. It's by our way and scientific way.